Hi, and welcome to The Fix, the podcast that's all about Lightroom, Photoshop, post-processing, and all the cool things that you can do with your photographs after the shoot. I'm Sean Duggan, and I'm filling in as a guest host for Jan Kabili, who's off traveling the world and having really fine adventures. At least, I hope she's having really fine adventures. I'm sure she probably is. Anyway, I look forward to hearing all about those adventures once she gets back. Today on The Fix, we're going to be talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is the art of creating composite images, images made from multiple photographs. And we're going to be looking at this from two different angles, both the kind of thematic and conceptual side of compositing, and also we're going to take a look at some of the technical uh, approaches that you might use in Photoshop. And I'm really pleased to have David Julian with me today to discuss this. David has long been one of my favorite compositing artists. He's a photographer, illustrator, and educator based in the Seattle area. And he has been doing uh, composites for many, many years, uh, both before Photoshop and obviously, you know, once Photoshop came into his life. So he's been making composites, really cool images, both for himself and for his many clients uh, for uh, over 20 years. And he also is a teacher and gives workshops on photography, Lightroom, and Photoshop. So David, great to have you here, and thanks so much for coming on to have this conversation about compositing. Hey Sean, nice to see you, and thank you very yeah, much for inviting me. This. this is awesome, yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, I really, really appreciate you because, you know, we are um, we are both uh, compositing artists. And in fact, I thought so much of your compositing work that I invited you to uh, contribute to the artist in the first person mm. section of my book, Photoshop Masking and Compositing, that I co-authored with Katrina Eisman and Jim Porto a couple of years ago. And I'm still a big fan of your work. And I thought that you'd be the perfect person to discuss uh, some of, you know, just the, the, the different aspects that come into play when you're thinking of a composite and creating a composite. So um, let's start off. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started with making composite images? Well, I think that the story goes back to when I was very, very young. And um, I, remember, I remember tearing apart magazines and newspapers and assembling these torn pieces on a window that I'd stick together with tape. And I started actually compositing that way uh, with allowing light to come through images and show me what was on the front and back. And it was a very haphazard but intuitive process. And oddly enough, it's very much the same the way I do it now. I use a lot of transparency um, at the beginning just to see images and how they relate to each other. So um, it's always been that way. But I went through a long period of drawing composites and then attempting to paint them. And finally, I was smart enough to uh, leave painting behind and pick up a medium that I really worked with very cleanly, and that was photographs. And so I did my compositing first with analog photography. And uh, yeah, eventually I was lucky enough to uh, have access to Photoshop in the early 90s. And that- And you, uh, you, know, you said in, in, your, um, in your piece in, in my compositing book, um, that you you wished for Photoshop like 30 years before it ever appeared, that you you sort of I envisioned or imagined a tool that would maybe allow you to be that fluid with the ideas and putting images together. Is that is that right? It, it's absolutely true. Um, when I was in Brooklyn at college and I discovered uh, Man Ray and Jerry Yulesman, actually Jerry Yulesman's work really turned me on. And his mastery in the darkroom was something that I never felt that I could reach. I didn't feel comfortable in the darkroom as much as I needed to be to do that kind of work. So I just said, boy, someday, you know, I'll get very, very lucky and there'll be a really wonderful tool. I probably thought of it earlier than that, but that was the first time I realized that this is where I want to be with, with my visual imagery. Um, when I'm not doing straight shots, documentary work and things like that. Yeah. Right, right. It, it's kind of like, you know, just being able to think of the composite or, or the mm -hmm. image and just sort of being able to sort of make it happen really easy. Yeah. I've done, um, I've actually done some uh, back in my darkroom days. I did some compositing work in the darkroom with you know different negatives, and, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. I was only working with a single and larger, uh, so which made mm -hmm. it even trickier. But um, yeah, it, it is Photoshop's a lot easier. We're just so lucky to have it. 
Yeah, it, it's interesting too because I've always seen the world in terms of layers. I've always, I've always been aware of a relationship between what was in front of me and what was next in line and next in line, which is one of the reasons I love fog. Fog feels like Photoshop with everything set to a certain opacity. And uh, there's a poetry to the way light hits objects as they recede in the distance. And I think that's just the way I like to uh, envision my, my workspace too. Right. Yeah. No, that's a, that, that's a great insight to envision things in layers. And, and I do the same thing when I'm out, um, you know, looking for a composite uh, is, is that, you know, a lot of times people ask me when I put something together, they think, or they ask me, well, how did you come up with that idea? How did you come up with the idea to place that doorway in that place or that mm -hmm. wall there or, or whatever it is that I've done? And I realized that I also sort of view the world in terms of layers or in terms of replacing something that's in a scene with something else. So there is that idea of, of looking kind of at the world as uh, a... a an amalgam of different, you know, layers or planes of view that take place at different distances. And yeah, mm -hmm. gee, I could maybe put something else in here and create an entirely different scene. Sure. It, I mean, everyone who designs their room, their office space is thinking in terms of what goes next to what, what works with what. We make these decisions intuitively and some of us act upon them and some don't. What you see behind me is in a sense a bit of an assemblage. You know, I feel like I'm part of the environment I create around me. And when I work in my composited space in Photoshop, um, I feel like I'm assembling a realistic environment. And that's where I head with that. I try to get lighting and shadow and dimension and color and space as realistic as possible because I want there to be a certain amount of believability, even in a world that's totally surreal. Right, right. Yeah. And that actually, that brings up a good point when you mention in terms of making, um, you know, the, the scene or the space that you create in Photoshop as realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. That brings up the the kind of idea that there are, you know, kind of different types of compositing that people may choose to uh, get involved with, depending on just their own personal interests, what they like to see in an image. But I, I kind of like to break these down as um, what I call, you know, overlay or, well, actually, first I, I call them collages, which mm -hmm. are kind of more like scrapbook type mm -hmm. uh collages where you might collage together you know paper elements or photographs it has a very two-dimensional uh feel to it and then there's the 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 overlay or blend mode type composites which are uh composites that rely on blending modes to create kind of a double exposure look where you have two images overlaid mm -hmm. on top of each other and they're kind of just blending together and then you have the the photorealistic uh, type composites, which is, you know, I know you, you really like to do those, as, as do I. Um, and and the bar of of how good the Photoshop work has to be sort of like gets higher, you know, the deeper you get into uh, the realm of photorealism. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think of those those overlaid collages or montages a lot like I do painting. You're mixing the colors, you're mixing the shapes, you're mixing them together. Whereas the photorealistic work everything is separated and detailed and has its own dimension and volume and space. Mm, great way to put that, great way. So when I work with students, one of the things I do is I learn about how, who are they and what are they interested in? So I ask them what, what artists they're interested in, what kind of work do they see when they go to a museum? What do they turn away from? And when I get to know who they are, I can better coach them on directing them towards the style or the tools to uh, realize their their um, constructions and composites that we do in, in the workshops. Oh, that's a great, a great point. You know, examining um, not only your artistic process is, is a really helpful way to kind of refine it and make it better, but also, as you pointed out, examining, you know, what are your influences? Wh who are the artists that Absolutely. you're drawn to? Yeah. Uh, what do you, it's a great, I love the way you put that in terms of like when you go into a museum, what are the types of works that you just are drawn to like a magnet? And what are the ones that you just kind of look at and go, eh, now I'll go over here. <laughs> right. All of us have peeked our head in a huge gallery that's got several people gawking at it. And we're just like, no, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> not here, not here. Mm. So what do you think um, makes a good composite image? Now, obviously, that's a really broad question. And, and of mm. course, the answer could be as varied as all the, you know, many different types of photographers in the world and the, the kind of images that they like to create. But what are the thing, some of the things that you think about, like, and that you communicate in some of your compositing workshops and whatnot mm -hmm. that, that do help create a good composite image? 
Well, for me, I think a certain amount of graphic simplicity and a really strong use of shadow and light and color. I'm really very much like what I look forward to seeing in painting or photography, even in dance. You know, when I've been to performances, when there's one dancer on stage or two dancers on stage with all that space around them, I have an easier time digesting what they're presenting than when there's 50 dancers on stage. So when I think of starting a composite, I think of the stage that we're creating on our canvas, our empty canvas, and the players upon that stage. If we have an idea and we're trying to recreate a specific environment, like from one of my um, corporate pieces, I might have a sketch or something that I have to work towards. But when I'm just freestyling it, um, I start with one thing and then think intuitively of what goes next to that and then do a little bit more planning around that. So simplicity, um, cleanliness, and yet um, having been very influenced by uh, Hieronymus Bosch, which is anything but simple, um, it has to do with how well you can work with the elements you know if there's a lot of elements then you have to be a little more decisive of which elements are major players and which ones are minor players in order for that balance to happen right um so when people yeah, are composite in, go ahead sean oh no i was just gonna say it's it's interesting that you mentioned that that aspect or that that concept of players um you know major players and minor players uh because i have long used that um, not necessarily for compositing, but just in, in, in regular photography and, and how I process image, I've used that kind of that stage metaphor that there is, there's typically usually a main performer or a main player mm -hmm. in the scene. And then there might be, uh, supporting cast members and, yeah. and this could just be a landscape. It could be a still life, but I sort of, uh, attach those, that kind of attributes onto the elements in the photograph. And that helps me actually figure out, well, how do I want to process this? How do I want to maybe throw a little bit more light on you know, one of my mm -hmm. main players, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that being aware of how people look at an image and where their eye goes, if you want to tell a story, tell the story and build the story. If you tell the story all at once, it's a little harder to digest it. So when people are building composites in my workshops, I say sometimes turn off those layers and see what you get and then start turning them back on or maybe lower their opacities and start to get a story that someone wants to walk into rather than slamming them with every image all at once, the same opacity, same size, you know, more right. or less a montage versus uh, an, an image. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, the, the story aspect is, is, is I think another important part about um, what makes a composite and, and you can use, different terms for that story idea concept sure. theme um but having a, an image that that um maybe serves as a a carrier for a metaphor or it it serves as a vessel for a metaphor so that somebody can walk up to that and you know it, it's kind of a bit of an open door to it invites them to come into the image and, and see what they can find based on their own personal experience that's right right we, you know we become responsible in part for what the viewer is first going to see what they do with it after that how they interpret it that's the fun part that's and that's why i like to have a lot of things that are what i call first read that's the main player second mm -hmm. read those are the less obvious players that support that graphically and then the third readers for those who really want to go deep and yeah. um some of them even find a little ant that i place in all of my pieces there's a single little <laughs> ant very realistic in all of my pieces those are that, that's the reward for the people who want to go deeper and look for things like that <laughs> that's that's great i'm gonna have to go back and review some of your pictures <laughs> go look, do the where the where's waldo thing of looking a little for the bit ant. yeah i've had a few co yeah. clients call and say is there an ant in this piece because i need to know <laughs> <laughs> well you know um I think that that's interesting, you know, that, that you characterize that as the first read, the second read. You're almost, you, you know, it, it's the metaphor of layers or levels in terms of what mm -hmm. uh, is going on in the composite for, for the viewer to discover uh, based on, you know, how deeply they want to look, how deeply they want to uh, search for a meaning in the picture, even if it's a meaning that you had, you know, no, uh, no idea of or no concept of when you created it. Sure. So it's it's kind of like in a way like when you read a book, uh, some books you read them and and you go and you read them the second time and you kind of or a movie for that matter you discover things that you just sort of missed or there's a subtext that you didn't quite see the first time around. So that's like one of the things that I love about art 
and, and photography is just that the, the interaction with the viewer really sort of can take the image in, in, in different ways that you could never really uh, imagine uh, when you created it. Yeah, you're forming a temporary relationship with the viewer. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Another thing that I liked is that, uh, you know, this is kind of getting back on that, that idea of um, that temporary relation, relationship with the viewer, as well as the, uh, you know, things that the viewer might see in the image, is that you, you mentioned to me this concept of um, truth mirrors. Uh, in terms of what happens sometimes when a viewer interacts with uh, an image. Can you like elaborate on that a little bit? Because I thought that, that was just so interesting. Thank you. Um, it, it's a weird idea, but I noticed that when images of mine are framed, let's say there's a gallery show or I've submitted something for a competition and I go there, um, I really dislike the idea of there being glass in front of my work because it adds reflections of what's in the background. Right? It's like working on your screen, and if it's highly reflective, you see what's behind you. And it's kind of in there's subtlety right. there, but it's there. But the cool thing is I noticed that sometimes people see themselves in the image. So they're looking at an image, it's fairly dark, like my fear piece, and a woman was standing there in this beautiful dress, a summer dress, and she looked very much like the woman, the young girl in the fear piece, and yet she could see herself in it. And I heard her talk about that. And I went, wow, ah. she's actually in the work. <laughs> That's so great. Maybe there's a bit of a mirror where my more surreal pieces that are causing people to wonder who I am, all of a sudden they're in the image as well. I don't know. Weird idea, but I thought I'd throw it to you. No, no, it's a, it's a great idea. I love that. Um, and, and I've sort of experienced something um, similar to that myself where I have been at a gallery show or an exhibition where, you know, my work was. And I've just sort of overheard things that people, you know, were discussing about my image. And a lot of times they were finding meaning in the image that uh, I had never even thought about uh, or coming up with a, a metaphor for what the image means to them. Uh, and, and that's just so exciting to me is to, to actually sort of be able to kind of, you know, get a sense of, of what other people are getting from the images, because that really is, is you know, uh, I think extends the life of, of any piece of artwork is the interaction with the viewer. Yeah. Yeah. So um, how important um, to you is uh, preconception or pre-visualization when you are working mm. on your composites? That is a great question. There are two ways that I work. I do work preconceived and preconceptualized, um, especially with clients where I have to actually show them a rough or a comp or a sketch and really solve a problem before we go to the approval process. Um, and that also gives me a chance to really decide what's my shoot list, what do I need to do? But then there's the, the playful part where you look at one of your images, maybe a past image, and suddenly it speaks to you and says, do something with me. Uh, put me with some other images. Let's create something new right now. And that's a mm -hmm. super compelling fun. That's that really cool uh, sandbox that you dive into and you spend hours just going through that process. <laughs> they're both they're both completely different processes. And yet, I also let my clients know that what you see in the sketch is not going to be exactly what you get because there's an interactive and kind of intuitive process that changes along the way. Uh, right. So I allow for all of that. And that's the playful part that keeps me wanting to do this. If I was painting by numbers, I would not have any fun. So, and, yeah. And do you, yeah. And, and do you, um, when you're out photographing, do you go and, um, are, is there a sort of a, a duality to how you approach the world when you photograph? And by that, I mean, you know, photographing just for the scene in front of you, whatever it is, maybe you're doing mm -hmm. street photography or landscape photography or whatever, but is there also a part of your mind that is sort of always attuned to the possibility of, oh, that could look, work really well on composite, and if I <laughs> photograph it such and such a way, I can, I can, I can do that. Absolutely. I, I, I see that as you say that, I bet there's a bit of recognition that you do that too. I think anyone who's been in Photoshop and yeah. does compositing realizes that they're building a library. They're building an archive of possibilities, of elements. Um, whenever there's downtime, if I'm out doing a landscape or I'm waiting for the light, I look around, what textures do I have here? What single images, what, what, what horizon can I capture? Those shapes, interesting. 
So, yes, we come back with interesting images from our trips. Uh, a lot of them have very purposeful meaning and other ones like, what is that for? <laughs> Why did you yeah, shoot that? It, <laughs> so, indeed. Yeah, it, there was a duality. And uh, sometimes it's a bit, um, it's a bit um, attention deficit. And I have to wheel it back in and say, okay, what am I here for? Yeah, you know, I find that, that, that in some cases I can juggle those well. In other cases, not so well, depending on uh, kind of how... Uh, how much concentration what I'm photographing really demands of me. So if it's if it's something right. that you know I'm photographing dancers, for instance, which I was uh, a few weeks ago, uh, you know that that was just sort of I really had to be present and totally following what they were doing. Completely. And you know I wasn't able to sort of do that that double tracking uh, quite as well. But um, the other thing is that uh, you know when I'm when I'm photographing. Um, for composites, sometimes it's also a little bit like note taking. It's it's kind of like a writer might go out and, and jot down quick little notes about an idea for a, a story or a poem or an article. And it's nothing fleshed out. It's very rough and, and bare bones. But, you know, I take photographs that way uh, sometimes just to sort of think, well, remind me, oh, well, this was really cool. And maybe I could mm -hmm. like whatever, transform it into something else just by doing X, Y, Z. Absolutely. In fact, um, I had a in 2003, I had a Fuji S2, my first digital SLR, and you could press a button on that camera and talk into your pictures and it would record a little AIF file and attach it to the picture. Brilliant. Oh, how great. It's so interactive. If I photograph, I, I remember photographing a woman who had a, uh, a parrot in a cage on her on her veranda above my head in the alley, and I could hear it before I saw it. And I thought, wow, I really want that sound. Um, a soundbite to remember this by. And that is the way I wish cameras were now, but few of them are. But I do have a notepad in my pocket and sometimes I'll sketch a note and I'll photograph it. And that just yeah. adds oh, to the ability idea. to record that because I won't remember it. I always think I will, I never will. So yeah. yeah and you, you can of course also use your, um, you can also use your smartphone, I suppose to do a yeah. quick little audio memo note on something. But but then it that's sort of like, like separate from the photo archive and you have to remember to link it up again and i really like your idea of actually making a note about something and just sort of taking a quick picture of that yeah sometimes you know what when i'm working sometimes i really don't want to spend the time to read all the signs and read all the descriptions i'll take a shot of it i'll read it later i know that's a little bit weird but i just want to keep <laughs> engaged i want to keep engaged and keep present with with the yeah. subject itself no I, I think it's a really nice simple solution i might have to to steal that from you and start using myself. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I know you have some images to share with us, and that way you can, uh, people watching the video version of the podcast can see uh, some of your very cool images, and you can deconstruct maybe some of the layers for us and mm -hmm. give us a sense of that, and, and also um, maybe show us an interesting technique or two. That'd be fun. Let me do that. Yeah. Let me go to yeah, a screen share. share. Um, I wanted to show a little bit about that idea of preconceiving. Um, this is a sketch for a job I just did for a magazine, and it was about inventions. And um, I knew I wanted to do a framed composite. Sometimes I put things in frames as if that they're actual uh, wall frame that you've attached pictures to, the way a lot of us have bulletin boards. Um, so here was the idea of multiple images with Alexander Graham Bell as the centerpiece. And uh, I'll just. Uh, Bring that up in Photoshop here so we can kind of zoom in and see. So it's it's rough. These are made from the sketches made from photographs. And this is just a way that I communicate to my client what it is I'm intending to do. And then again, as I said, I caution them that what they actually get will be a riff on this. Um, so here is the piece that resulted from that. Um, it turned out that I put the frame on the wall and then I had a table. Uh, I found a table in Maine while I was teaching there, and I took Alexander Graham Bell's first phone, which was really a stock photo that was licensed and um, created the realism of that on the table, as well as the first Polaroid uh, camera, which was invented in Boston, part of this article. So oh, this is a yeah, this is a real shot of a camera I bought on eBay. This is a shot that's a stock shot from the ar um, from the archives, and I had to create the angle to make them realistic. So. The reason that I'm mentioning all of this is the idea helps me focus on what I need to do and what process I'm, go I'm going to be in in order to achieve it. All the while, um, I am 
keeping in mind that things will change along the way. So the camera that was once up here in the sketch, right up next to Alexander Graham Bell, is now on a table. A little bit mm -hmm. more realistic context. But what I think really makes this a believable composite is that I use shadows and highlights to indicate that things are not flat. So these are all flat stock images that were licensed, this, these two from MIT. And yet by bending them, warping them, and creating the creases and bends that happen in a stack of old photos, um, enhancing the realism of the situation I'm trying to mock up, and also giving myself a chance to get into my favorite play zone, which is light and shadow. Um, so as we go through the world and photograph, notice how light and shadow works. When you review your images, especially if you shoot objects, notice the way things cost, cast shadows. So I actually keep a desk lamp and some plasticine and some paper clips and a couple of little wooden artists' uh, figurines, and I can pose them and get an idea of how light will hit. Um, but this is all from memory, so I'm going to just hit my move tool, and I have direct uh, direct choice here on the layers. So if I click this, it'll go to that layer, and I can show you that there's a shadow behind there that creates the um, idea of dimension. So there's without the shadow, and there's with the shadow. So you can see that the shadow itself really helps give the viewer the idea that this is on a surface, but hovering over another surface that's further away. So yeah, when you know it's very, very effective. It's pretty realistic. One of the things you have to keep in mind when you do these, though, is if you use Photoshop's tool that is really a layer effect, uh, it's down here. If you go into these layer effects, at the very bottom, you have drop shadow. I'm going to engage it now so you can see the shadow that's created. And you can actually, you can, you can set this and set this, but really all you have to do is drag the shadow where you want it. Um, I'm going to unconnect, disconnect, use global light because that makes all the shadows in my image exactly the same. So I'm positioning this shadow here and I'm using size to create the softer edge of that shadow. But it's important to think about how that shadow really would cast itself on a nearby object. It'll be sharper where the object's near it. Um, it'll be sharper, sharper against the closest objects in more diffuse against the furthest object. So even the dimension of this frame requires that this shadow might need a little bit more softness over here. But the layer style only gives you one softness, one spread, which is the width of it, and one distance. But if I at least start with that, I know that I can begin to see what I need to do. And then if I want to warp that shadow or change it a little bit, I have to disconnect it from the layer. And this is a technique that I don't think very many people um, know about, and I don't know if I've even seen it in too many books. Um, but when you go to that layer, you can actually go to layer, layer style, which is the layer style that's a drop shadow that I have here, and you can go create layer. And now what it does is it separates that effect, that drop shadow, into a separate layer that I can manipulate. I can manipulate it many different ways. I can change its opacity. Right? I can bend it and warp it. So I'll go into edit, transform, whoops, warp. And now I can stretch that shadow to be a little bit further away as the curl of this image is distant from the background, right? Because the lip of this curl is a little further away than that part. Now we're talking about right, real yeah. de really intense detail here, which probably a lot of people don't need in their images, but I do in mine. I think it's part of the fun of it for me. So once I've got that warp, I'll say OK. And now I have a shadow that's behaving a little bit differently. Um, so all of these shadows are created that way, um, or they're hand drawn if I don't want to begin with um, the object. So for instance, down here, I couldn't do it that way. I had to actually draw a shadow because the lighting is strong. It's from this area here. And a drop shadow would simply repeat this outer shape. Same right, with the yeah. You're right, same with the camera. Um, so stand things up on your desk, have a desk lamp, have diffusion, anything you can do to teach yourself, um, if you're doing this kind of composite, that is, what shadows really look like. In this case, as I shot the camera on a piece of seamless, um, I was able to see the real shadow in the original shot before I isolated the camera from its background 
using um, selection tools. And yeah, that's it's a great point about you know going through the world and and looking at shadows and light and how they are interacting with elements that we see in in the real world. Because if you you do pay a lot of attention to that, it can really help uh, kind of take your your Photoshop compositing work um, up a notch or two or three, just because you you are using those two things that that really tell us that yes, something is really there pinned to that bulletin board because. There's the highlights, there's the shadows. Absolutely. And the wall that you can't see that's in front of me behind my computer is full of things pinned to the wall. So I have lots of live reference floating around um, <laughs> right now. Um, on this image here, um, it was also a flat image, but, but the other thing I want to point out is aside from shadow, which you see this shadow is bent in an arc underneath this image. Yeah. Well, because I want to convey that this photograph is warped. And yes. another thing is I, I put a highlight on the image and all I had to do was lock down the transparency, take a white brush like this. Oh, and that's a too large brush, so I'm going to shrink that brush down. And I always use a low opacity and I always use my Wacom tablet because, as you probably know, Sean, there is no substitute for having the sensitivity, the pressure sensitivity that Photoshop and Wacom have built into uh, the product line. Yeah, exactly. It, it is a great way to uh, yeah. just have, you know, be able to sort of uh, vary that intensity or the pressure and have it uh, translate to how the effect mm -hmm. is being applied. Right. So even though I'm not, I don't need this particular uh, shine, I'm just going to show you how I create that. So I just simply build up some white. Sometimes I even put this on overlay. Um, but you notice it doesn't go off the edge of the object because I've locked down the transparency of the layer. That's what this little guy does. It keeps me painting within mm -hmm. the lines. If I didn't do that, then it goes all over the background. Right. So, yeah. Now, in, in doing that, would you be uh, no, norm? I know that for the demo purposes here, you're just sort of doing it right on the, the, the photographic, the layer of the actual picture of the radar. Disc. Right. Uh, right. Would you normally be putting that on a separate layer just to have the flexibility to further tweak it with opacity and blend modes and such? Um, the answer is yes, I often do that. It would, when I'm feeling completely confident and I'm working quickly and I don't think I'll need to do any tweaks, I'll do it directly on it. Um, but often I will make a separate layer like this. I'll make sure that I've got the opacity up the way I want it. Sometimes it's going to be less than 100. And what I'll do in order to confine the strokes that I'm going to make to the edges of that object is I'll command click on the layer below it, the actual photo, and that draws the marching ants right around the edges there. And now my brush strokes will be forced to stay within the lines. Whoops, right. sorry. <laughs> so yes, two ways of doing it. Thanks for pointing that out. I use both. Cool, excellent. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, technique about uh, separating the uh, kind of canned layer effect drop shadow that you can create in Photoshop to separate it out to a separate layer so that you can then manipulate it independently. Uh, I've yeah. used that before myself many times, but um, then, you know, uh, I'll, I'll go by where I'm not actually using it for a while and I almost kind of forget that it's there. And then I'll go into that menu and go, oh, yeah, I can do this. It's a great, great way to do this. Absolutely. It, there's always, you know, one of the great things about Photoshop is there's many different ways of doing things. And one of the horrible things about Photoshop is there's many different ways of doing things. Um, and so yeah. <laughs> somet sometimes when I teach it and I'd show my way, another student will say, but so-and-so teaches it this way. It's like, great, then you have a chance to try both because <laughs> there are a lot of yeah, ways yeah, of solving See what same works problem. for you, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, definitely. Like, cool. Yeah, and so I just brought this one up, Sean, because uh, this was an earlier piece, uh, 19, I don't know, 99, and um, it was an extensive use of layers. This was long before we even had layer groups, but later on I organized my image with layer groups. So lots of players on the stage in this case, not as, uh, not as simple as some of my others, but that's because this was a magazine cover and this was a fold-in of that cover. So uh, I had a lot to say. Yeah, um, but but you can see how shadow and light plays a lot of role here on the uh, perception of dimensionality. Um, 
even the shadow cast by this object onto this one. Um, so one of the things that I find myself tweaking and noodling um, after I've got the main players on the stage is are these little effects. Um, right. what, I'll, what I'll suggest to the viewers out there is that they restrain themselves from noodling these perfectionistic uh, portions until they've got the players on the stage, the size is correct, and mostly you're pretty much there. Um, this is the kind of stuff that can take a long time, and I try to reserve it for um, for the post, in a sense, the post-production of my image, because I have a deadline and I want to achieve it, and I don't want to get lost in the details and then forget to do some of the major things. Yeah, that's a great tip. In fact, I um, I, I do something similar just in, in when I'm making masks for uh, elements in some of my composites, where I will initially just start out with a fairly rough mask just to sort of get the image in there and see if it's working. You know, it's kind of like almost mm -hmm. like a proof of concept thing and i won't really worry about spending tons of time making a super accurate ultra precise right. mask until i know yes this is the image i want to use with this exactly um when when i have a folder full of images that are going to be in a composite the way that i bring them into the photoshop workspace first of all i make a canvas that's way larger than my intended piece so that i have extra stuff on the edges to push images off to the side while i temporarily solve a problem and then bring them back into the place. I could just turn them on and off, but I want them visibly there. Um, yeah. So I That's make a, a large great canvas. I like that idea. I draw guides to show the area that I'm going to work in, especially if I'm working towards a magazine cover or something that's got a defined proportion. And then I will literally take that folder of images, I will open it, I'll grab maybe half a dozen, and I will drag them right into that Photoshop canvas. And they start placing themselves one by one. And after they're all placed, I don't have to place them in position, but I place them all somewhere on that canvas. I'll, I'll select all of those layers and drag the opacity slider down to a lower opacity so that I can see through all of them. And notice I just grabbed the ah. word opacity there and I scrubbed the word opacity. I'm not doing it the slow way, which is to open this and use the slider or type in a number. I find that distractingly slow. So as you know, there's four ways of changing the opacity, but the fastest way is to either grab this, or if you're in the move tool, you can actually hit the number keys on your keyboard. The three would be 30%, or would be 40%, etc. cetera. So I'm always shifting the opacity to see past something into something else. Excellent, excellent tip. All those are great tips. Thanks so much for for sharing that. Another thing I can suggest is organization. I don't necessarily keep things as organized while I'm working, but when I take a pause, a break from the work, I organize my um, my elements into these layer groups so that I can better organize my mind and so that I can find things when I need them. If these were all separate layers as I really built the piece, it would be very confusing. Yeah, so, a little, little housekeeping. I can't say my office looks anywhere near as organized as this, or my mind, but my work is. Yeah, no, I'm the, I'm the same way. My, my my initial when I'm working on the piece, it, it's kind of unorganized, but I do try to yeah. take the time to to go in and clean it up. Uh, you know, once I'm sort of prepping the final file. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I just noticed the ant in this picture. Oh, you did. You found the ant. So yeah, once you pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Zoom up close to show us the ant before you finish your screens here, just so that we can see that. See, now I'm going to have yeah. to go back and get all your pictures. Uh, of course, this is a low res image right now, um, just yeah. for speed. So it's not sharp, but it is a tack sharp ant that I shot in Costa Rica way back. Um, and the reason for the ant is that I have a background in entomology and the sciences before I got into the arts. And this helps me keep one foot into that former time of mine. Um, but I also appreciate ants because they're hardworking, they communicate effectively, and uh, they're just a little symbol to me of, um, of, of another part of my life that I enjoy. <laughs> How's that cool. for eccentric? That, that's great. No, I, I love those little references. It's, uh, it's kind of like, a, a, now that we know that, it's kind of like a little Where's Waldo game we can play with your, your images. Yeah, the there are some that are actually uh, embedded a little bit more interestingly. I did a piece where there was a circuit board at the background, and um, there was an ant actually soldered to that circuit board. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. 
I yeah, I, cool. I thought I had this piece here, but I don't. So, um, yeah, shadow and light, even in a more photographic piece that's less composited, very important to get dimension through a light source and the comprising shadow there. And another thing that I'll mention is focus. Um, when we see photographs, one of the things that cues us into distance is what's in focus, what's not in focus. So I use defocusing. Um, uh, basically, I'll, I'll make a smart filter layer on a smart object, and I'll defocus the background slightly in order to provide more of that apparent depth. So no, that was a great conversation. I really enjoyed um, kind of riffing on some of those aspects of compositing with you and, and love seeing some of those, those tips. Um, and thanks for kind of reintroducing me to the, uh, uh, the fact that you can create a layer from uh, a Photoshop layer style um like a drop uh -huh. shadow effect because it is really really useful yeah so, so uh where can people find you uh out on the web how can they learn more about you you got any wor new workshops coming up to tell us about if you go to my website davidjulian.com mm -hmm. um, then you will find all of my work that i do show publicly online um, which is never quite brought up to date i'm afraid but you'll also see a workshops link and that leads to a page uh, that's actually attached to my blog, and um, which you can subscribe to, and then you'll know more about me more frequently. Um, but there's workshops described there. There are some that are still tentative, but they're listed, and there are others that have defined dates. So I'll be uh, teaching in Maine annually. That's one of our favorite places. I think that's where you and I met. And, um, yeah, it was I'll, a couple years ago. Sure. Yeah, I'll be teaching in um, California, Portugal, Cuba, um, you know, those are some of those are photographic workshops. Some are more Lightroom based, and some are more Photoshop based. All of them incorporate seeing photography, working with your subject. Anyway, all the principles that we both uh, enjoy. Great, cool. Well, thanks so much, and uh, I will put a a link to your website in the show notes, so thank you. Uh, you can find that there. Just davidjulian.com, and. Again, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we can have one of these conversations again in the future sometime, maybe delve into some other aspect of working in Photoshop. Thank you. I would love to. Thank you so much, Sean. It's really great to see you. It's been a while. And thanks for inviting me. Great to be part of this. Yeah. Cool. Great to Excellent. Be part of this. All right. All right, everybody. Well, that's this episode of The Fix. Thanks for watching and listening. And be sure to tune in next week when we'll have more cool stuff to talk about as it relates to Lightroom, Photoshop, and other post-processing apps.